I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Mimi Kolf. Uh, she's a professor of the Department of Integrative Biology at University of California, Berkeley. She studied uh, the physics of our organisms, including microorganisms, interact with their environment. So she uses both field studies and lab studies of food dynamics and the biomechanics. Um, she focuses on organisms like kelp and seagrass and coral and how these interact with waves and, um, and currents in the turbulent ocean. Uh, Professor Coles, a uh, member of the National Academy of Sciences and of the Academy, uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's received many awards, including um, MacArthur Genius Grants and a Guggenheim uh, Fellowship. And we're happy to uh, have her speak to us today. Thank you. Go ahead, Mimi. Okay, uh, uh, my field is ecological biofluid uh, dynamics, so I study the physics of how organisms interact with their environment. So where can I publish? I have too much hydrodynamics for a biology journal and too much biology for a fluid mechanics journal. But now there's this new journal called Flow, and they say they will publish papers where fluid mechanics is leveraged to provide new insights into nature. So this sounds to me like a great place for ecological biomechanics. So what I wanna to do today is introduce those of you who don't know what this field is. Uh, I wanna talk a, a little bit about an example of one of our uh, studies in ecological biomechanics, which is locomoting in a turbulent environment. And I'm gonna focus on ways we've come up with to study microscale processes that are going on in a large scale ocean. So a basic question we've been asking is how does interaction with the fluid environment affect how animals move in messy natural habitats? And the system I wanna talk about today is microscopic organisms swimming in turbulent water flow in the ocean. And there are some real challenges of scale in ecological biofluid dynamics. One challenge is that um, how do we design small scale experiments to measure organism behavior or function, but do it under hydrodynamic conditions that are like those they actually experience out in the large scale ocean. And the other challenge of scale is how do we include small scale behavior and function of organisms into our analyses of processes that are occurring at larger scale flows. So um, the hydrodynamic studies of small organisms uh, until recently have come in two flavors. One are fine scale studies, both in the lab and modeling, and their focus is the motion of the organism through the water, and these studies typically have no ambient flow. On the larger scale, both field studies and models, the focus is transport of these organisms by turbulence and currents in natural bodies of water, and in these studies, the organisms are uh, treated as passive tracers simply carried by the flow. So what we've been trying to do is couple the motion of a microorganism through the water with realistic ambient flow and ask how does the interaction between these two scales affect the performance of ecologically important functions of the organisms and determine where they go in the water or when they're crawling on surfaces and the signals they encounter along the way. So the example I wanna talk about today are um, marine larvae. So many bottom dwelling organisms like barnacles and snails and corals um, disperse to new habitats by releasing microscopic or, uh, larvae that are transported by ocean currents. For those larvae to recruit to a new site on the sea floor, they have to move out of the water column down into the habitat. And this is a process that happens on a spatial, spatial scale of meters to millimeters. Where larvae settle out of the water column onto the sea floor is enormously important ecologically. For one thing, it affects the geographic distribution, dynamics, and genetics of populations of various uh, species of organisms. And if we focus on particular sites, this process uh, is very important in determining the composition of communities of different species of organisms living together on the bottom. I'm interested in how larvae settle 
out of the water column into a suitable habitat. The example I want to talk about today is the sea slug Festilla sabogi, and it uh, lives on coral reefs and they are voracious predators. And you see here two Festilla eating, they're, they're finicky eaters and they only eat one species of coral, Parietes compressa. So it's critical that they, their larvae settle on reefs where Parietes uh, is abundant. So how do they land on a reef where Parietes is abundant? This is a larva of a Festilla. They're tiny, they're only 200 microns long, and they swim by beating cilia on an organ called the velum. So the approach that we've been using to address this question has a number of steps. First, we measure water flow in the field. So we get boundary layer profiles and instantaneous velocity fluctuations of natural ambient flow. The next thing we do is use those data so that we can mimic that flow field in wave flumes in the lab where we can do much finer scale measurements of water flow and chemical concentration distributions in the water. And then once we know those fine scale measurements, we mimic those very fine scale conditions in even smaller devices where the performance of these organisms can be measured and viewed through the microscope. And then we use what we've learned from those uh, uh, performance experiments with organisms to um, uh, develop agent-based models uh, in uh, larger scale uh, measured flow fields. So let's um, go through an example. Let's look at measuring water flow in the field. Uh, this is our field site, it's Kaneohe Bay. Uh, on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. And it's a great study site because it has a bunch of patch reefs. So we can do replicate experiments on different reefs. And so one of the things we did was measure water velocity profiles above and within the coral reefs. And we used acoustic Doppler velocimetry to uh, measure water velocity profiles. Uh, and let me just show you an example of a little snippet of data uh, from two centimeters above the reef. So what you see plotted here is flow velocity as a function of time. And I'm just showing the uh, shoreward and sea seaward component of the flow. And what you see is this back and forth motion that's typical of waves. And um, the peak velocities close to the bottom are about 20 centimeters per second. Free stream up near the top is, of the water is um, more like a meter per second. And then all these little jiggles in the flow are due to turbulent uh, velocity fluctuations. And we wanna quantify the temporal pattern of the flow fluctuations in natural flow so we can replicate it in the lab. So we do a spectral analysis of our flow data and ask how much of the variation in velocity is due to fluctuations at different frequencies. And the, this is an example from the data I just showed you. Here are the waves and here are turbulent eddies of various sizes. So then we want to uh, mimic that kind of flow in a wave flume so we can do finer scale measurements. And here's an example of doing that. What you see here are uh, the benthic organisms on the floor of the, the wave flume and the water's flowing back and forth and we've mimicked the turbulent spectrum and the velocity uh, gradient. Uh, uh, of the flow we measured in the field. And these little snowflakes you see are neutrally buoyant marker particles illuminated by a sheet of laser light. We also have painted the corals with a dye that dissolves off of them. And that's our analog for coral odor or cue, chemical cues in the water. And uh, uh, this is a, a frame of a video uh, the technique is called planar laser induced fluorescence and the pixel brightness is calibrated for Q concentration. So we get a fine scale map of odor concentration as well. So we simultaneously have two cameras going, one with a filter uh, to capture particles for particle image velocimetry, and another one for a filter for the fluorescent dye so we can measure odor concentrations. And this is an example of the kind of data that we get as the water sloshes back and forth and those odors are uh, mixed up into the 
uh, water above the reef. So we see that the velocity vectors and the Q concentrations change with time on uh, scales of fractions of a second to seconds. And at any instant, we see that the velocity and the Q concentrations vary on a very fine spatial scale. Uh, so if we think about a microscopic larva of a sea slug, as it's swimming along, um, you know, odor plumes have, uh, for big organisms like us, are modeled as diffusing clouds. But for a microscopic organism, you can see in this picture, it's sitting in a black region, which means it's not an odor. But if it swims along, it will encounter a filament of uh, odor Q over the reef. So let's mimic what a larva would see on a very fine scale in a device so we can see how it reacts to filaments of odor Q. So here's a larva glued to a tether and notice he's very tiny. We're looking through a microscope and he's swimming in a small flow tank where the flow relative to him is his um, at the same speed that he swims. So he's swimming along and in clean water, his velum is expanded, the cilia are beating, he's happily swimming. But when he uh, encounters a, a filament cue carried in the flow past him, he retracts the velum and if he weren't tethered, he would sink. And when the larva exits a cue film, filament, the velum uh, re-expands and the cilia resume beating. So these larvae are stupid little on-off machines who are triggered to uh, sink if they encounter odor cue. So uh, let's use this organism performance in agent-based models of these organisms in larger scale measured flow fields. So we can calculate in a model the trajectory of a larva in the following way. The larval velocity at each time step is going to equal its swimming or its sinking velocity. And we decide which it's doing by measuring the brightness of the pixel in which the larva is sitting in our flow data uh, to decide if it should sink or swim. And its swimming direction depends on the local instantaneous vorticity of the previous time step, which has aimed it in the direction it's going now. So we have the larva's velocity through the water, but it's tiny and it's being carried in the water around it. So we take the vector sum of its velocity and the local instantaneous ambient water velocity that's carrying it because they swim more slowly than the ambient flow. And together that predicts the position of the larva at the next instant and so on. So then we can do an agent-based model where we calculate the trajectory of thousands of larvae ran at randomly chosen starting positions in our um, flow data. And uh, we can calculate the rate of transport of larvae into the reef. And we can do it, the beauty of models is you can make the larvae do whatever you want. So let's compare if larvae sink in odor and do it for larvae that do not respond to odors. And in turbulent wavy flow, the model predicts that uh, the simple behavior of sinking in Q enhances transport rates into the reef by about 20%. So this uh, stupid little on off machine can actually bias the way the ambient flow is carrying these larvae. Well, once you land, can you stay put? How does flow through a reef re affect where larvae can hang on to the reef to actually settle and recruit? So if a larva is only a few hundred microns tall, what flow velocities does uh, he encounter? And our field ADB data won't tell us that because they don't get close enough to the surface. So again, we mimic the uh, um, field flow in a wave flume and made a fine scale measurement, this time using laser Doppler velocimetry. And so we can measure flow velocities just 200 microns from coral surfaces at the height of these larvae. And we can do it at different positions like the tips of coral branches at the top of the reef or coral surfaces down within the reef. And here's an example of flow just 200 microns from surfaces. And remember, free stream velocities peak at over uh, a meter per second. And here's flow at the top of the reef and flow down uh, within the reef eight centimeters below. And you can see in both cases that uh, the larvae are encountering brief pulses of rapid flow um, 
uh, that are of fractions of a meter per second. So what happens to this larva when he gets hit by a pulse of water flow? So to look at that, we can mimic fine scale conditions, again, in devices where we can measure the organism performance. So we rigged up a fluidic device that delivers pulses of water flow along a substratum, and we can measure local instantaneous velocities with PIV. And here are some larvae that are crawling on the bottom uh, when this um, happens, and we can digitize their behavior and follow the time course of a pulse of water. And I should say that uh, until we did this work, the standard way of measuring the adhesive strength of, of larvae or any small organism was to expose them to steady shear and measure what it took to blow them away. And so these larvae stick to the bottom with mucus. So in steady water flow, the mucus stretches and it breaks and the larva blows away. But we know that mucus is a shear thinning material. And so what uh, happens if we give them a flow pulse is the mucus stretches, and, uh, but it never becomes uh, fluid. And uh, when the pulse stops, the mucus recoils. So they're on a bungee cord of mucus. And it turns out that the larval adhesive strength is far greater in pulse flow than anybody thought by measurements in steady flow. Anyway, uh, here again are the velocity uh, measurements uh, near uh, the surface of the reef and down within the reef. And these uh, green lines are the mean and the standard deviation of the peak velocity of a pulse of flow uh, uh, to blow a larva away. And what you can learn from this is uh, if a larva is crawling on the top of the reef, it's going to blow away. And the, uh, but it can stay put within the reef. So recruitment can only happen within the reef, not at the top. Yep. So larvae change shape during metamorphosis from the larva to the juvenile stage. And does that developmental change affect the drag force they're exposed to? Larvae and newly metamorphosed, metamorphosed juveniles are really small and uncooperative. So we can answer this question by measuring drag on big models. So we use dynamically scaled physical models of larvae. So the ratios of forces and velocities are the same around the model as around the real larva if they operate at the same Reynolds number. So we can have a real larva and a big model of a small larva. So length is greater, but we can maintain Reynolds number by operating at a low velocity in a highly viscous fluid. So how does shape affect drag? Here's an example of what our models show us. This is drag plotted as a function of velocity for different uh, postures and morphologies of the larvae. And you can see at the top of the reef where the flow is fast, shape matters and the drag on the juvenile is much lower than on the larvae. But in slower flow in the reef, the shape doesn't matter. So let me stop and summarize. We measured water flow in the field over coral reefs and we found it was wavy and turbulent. And uh, we, um, measured the dispersal of dissolved uh, chemical cues from the reef, and we found on the scale of larvae that it's filamentous, so they encounter on-off cue. Uh, water flow in the reef on the scale of a larva uh, is uh, characterized by pulses of rapid flow, and it's slower within the reef than on the top. And um, if we compare the drag on the larva and then the juvenile, we see that shape matters on the reef top, but not in the reef. And so we learn that larvae can only settle within the reef, but once they metamorphose into juveniles, they can crawl up to the top of the reef where all the coral meat is and forage without blowing away. So these were examples of how we met challenges of scale in ecological biofluid dynamics to design small scale experiments that are in uh, hydrodynamic conditions that are realistic and to include small scale behavior and function in larger scale flow. This kind of work uh, involves people from a lot of fields and these are the collaborators on different aspects of what I talked to you about. And, uh, there are engineers and biologists and physicists and mathematicians uh, all involved here from several universities. So I'll stop now and see if you have any questions. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great talk. Uh, yeah, Mimi. Uh, so maybe I'll ask a question. I don't think there's um, a hand up yet. Um, are there any non other non-dimensional parameters that have to be met to, for example, account for the deformation of these? Is... 
for example, are the, are the stresses on the body enough to deform them? Yes. So, um, so our particular larvae that I talked about here are rigid and they don't deform in the uh, flows that, that they're exposed to. But when we do similar studies with other kinds of organisms, we have to make the, um, the uh, flexible parts of them elastically similar to the, the real thing. So the amount of deformation that they get relative to their body in properly scaled flow has to be the same. So we have to worry about that. And we can't scale the Reynolds number and um, uh, study diffusion with a large model. You can't do that kind of scaling. So what we do is scale the flow and then we calculate the molecule um, transport in the flow because you can't uh, experimentally scale the two. Yeah, the, it's, it's like a Peckley number and a Reynolds number. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very, very cool stuff. Very multidisciplinary.